think if you want to be a fantastic architect, you actually now need to understand that we are service providers and we work as part of a bigger development machine. Business of Architecture, episode 298. Welcome back, Architect Nation. Recently, I was talking with Ryan Willard, who is the host of the Business of Architecture UK podcast. Now, those of you who have been longtime podcast listeners, you know that originally, Ryan provided content and interviews here for the Business of Architecture podcast, but ultimately, he was producing such great content that we spun off that podcast, and Ryan now has his own show. Well, I was talking with him recently and asking him, Ryan, what's been your favorite interview out of all the interviews you've done? And also, which interview has been the most popular with your audience? And he said, without a doubt, this interview that you're going to hear today with Joe Cohen. So Joe Cohen is an architect based out of the UK, and she has an amazing entrepreneurial story. She began her practice as two people in her loft to a 40-person strong practice on Kings Road working on multi-million pound developments. In this interview, which is taken directly from the Business of Architecture UK podcast, Jo shares her accomplishments, business strategies, and mindsets behind her remarkable success in this interview. I know you're absolutely going to love this interview. There's a lot of golden nuggets here from a woman who's very accomplished and has achieved some amazing things. In this episode, you will discover how Jo uses an innovative business model to recession-proof her practice how she won multi-million pound projects as a small practice, and how developers call on her first with their best sites. Now, if you're not already subscribed to the Business of Architecture UK podcast, you're missing out on some incredible interviews that Ryan Willard is doing over there with our practitioners who practice in the UK and beyond. To find that podcast and to subscribe to it, Head over to iTunes and search for Business of Architecture UK, or you can just search for Business of Architecture, or go to your favorite podcasting app. If you're not already subscribed to the Business of Architecture UK podcast, you're missing out on an incredible resource and information about how to create a practice that fuels your ability for creative expression, designing excellent projects, and beautiful, meaningful work. In addition, if you'd like to get additional content and also see the videos behind these interviews, make sure you subscribe to Business of Architecture on YouTube. So just head on over to YouTube, search for Business of Architecture, you'll be able to see our channel. And we produce most of these interviews on the podcast. We actually also produce them in video format, if that's something that you prefer, in addition to providing other content, interviews, and behind-the-scenes resources that we do not provide here on the podcast. So head on over to youtube.com, search for Business of Architecture, and don't forget to subscribe to the Business of Architecture UK podcast. That is an incredible resource if you're looking to build a practice that is fulfilling, gives you freedom, and maximizes your financial opportunities. So with that, here let's jump into this interview. Ryan Willard speaking with architect and founder of Joe Cohen Architects, Joe Cohen. Good afternoon and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm here with Joe Cowan of Joe Cowan Architects. Good afternoon. Hi, Ryan. Absolute pleasure to meet you and Lovely to be to with you again. You. Um, and Joe Cowan runs Joe Cowan Architects, who are a 40 person strong uh, architectural practice based in West London, specializing in luxury residential work and are moving into um, higher residential developments. Um, and I'd, I'm just the first question, really, that I want to talk to you is about how did you start the practice? Um, well, we started the practice in 2012. Um, I had spent seven years working at Roger Sturk Harbour and Partners mm. and before that Fosters and Partners and decided that I wanted to go independent. I started the practice like many architects do, working in the evenings, moonlighting from Rogers, doing my neighbor's side extensions, loft extensions and local planning applications. Um, after doing that for about eight or nine months, I decided that I had enough workflow. Um, at that point, I was uh, rather sneakily utilizing some of my colleagues at Rogers <laughs> to draw up planning applications. So we had a sort of mini organization going um, and we were running sort of eight to ten planning apps and, and tender sets at any one time. Mm. As more of the project started on site, I realized I needed to get out of the, uh, the confines of, of being employed. And so I set up on my own. Um, in my loft and uh, continued to utilize sort of freelance staff from around London. Um, 
After that, I then we grew to sort of four or five people and we moved into service offices. And so the practice was born. And were you still doing primarily sort of uh, extensions, high end so residential first, work? For the first year, um, all the, the only work we were able to win was um, extensions and basements to uh, Victorian and Georgian housing stock within West London primarily. Um, obviously from Rogers, we'd come from a multi-unit background where I was working on, on flats for St. James's as well as buildings like the Leadenhall building and the British mm. Museum. So my natural tendency was to try and escalate the practice out of just doing the domestic single houses and into more commercial and multi-unit developments. That's quite a challenge for yes. any architect. Um, most of the team actually all being freelance from Rogers or who, many of whom had left Rogers all had that level of experience. But our biggest challenge at that point was how we were going to break from that single domestic house, um, as fantastic as it is, into the, the multi-unit and the commercial and the largest freestanding standalone buildings in London. Yeah. And how did you begin to navigate that process? I think our first um, lucky break was we... Uh, was actually on Bakery Place. We approached the developer, cold call, repetitively. Um, actually, I eventually contacted Savills and realized he was going down to site to buy this bakery, and I just turned up on site. Um, the developer was quite a new developer. It was a very big development for him. He'd come from single houses. Um, his name is Wilhelm and from West Eleven, and he's one of my closest friends and, and still a very strong client today. Um, and what we did there was we said to the developer we would joint venture and that we would invest some of our planning fees into the development. Mm. Um, many developers do, are very, very sort of pressured for cash or for capital at the, the initial stages until they've actually secured a planning permission on a site. All money they're spending is at risk. So the cost of that equity or capital is very high. Yeah. So by doing a salary forfeit for shares within the SPV, and an SPV is a, a special financial vehicle, it's, it's the company as such, mm. um, we were leaving it some of that. And I think that was ultimately what made him take that risk to go with an unproven architect who'd only done single domestic. So that, that's quite a, a sort of innovative jump for an architect to be thinking like that and also to be actually matching uh, or understanding the developer's pain point about where they're kind of where they're struggling the most. I think the I've um, read a lot you know there's a lot of architects read architects books in the evenings I spend a lot of time in reading real estate property investment management in the evenings um, I've recently just enrolled for um, one of the investment management courses at Reading um, through their property program um, and continue to truly understand how the funding structures work around developments because mm. ultimately often as an architect your client isn't necessarily the developer it's it's the set of individuals funding your developer. Yeah, the joint venture partners or wherever the cash is coming Correct. from, essentially. Um, so from Bakery, that one is a large project, and we completed that successfully. And halfway through that, a good relationship with the same developer, he brought a, um, a very small site to us in Wandsworth, which was zoned for five stories. We said to him, this was, this was Battersea Park Road, and we said to him, let's try for 15 to 20 stories on the site, and let's do a Rogers or a Foster's with this site. We were super ambitious. I think himself and the planning consultants thought we were absolutely crazy. Um, but we said to him, look, the architectural fees on a 20-story on a building in this location are going to be four or 500 grand. We're going to invest those fees again. Uh, therefore, we're going to carry that risk on the basis that if we don't get planning, we ultimately don't get paid. Mm. That's not entirely true in the fact that you actually are taking shares within the company that owns the building. Yeah. So if you actually don't get the planning permission, you still retain an ownership in the original site, but you're probably going to make a bit of a loss in terms of what you've covered. So why, is, why would you say that this is a better strategy or a better business model than, say, being the developer yourself or trying to take on that role as well? Well, I think twofold, really. Um, being a development manager is a very different skill set mm. to being a funder and being an architect. Um, development managers actually have a a pretty miserable time in many ways. Um, they're dealing with land and site and program issues and, and dealing with the ultimate consequence of that in terms of funding. But I think fundamentally, the developer is your client. So whilst we as an architect's practice have evolved actually to actually now develop a further capital company, we would never become developers because it ultimately becomes a conflict with our core business. We can't become competitive. We need our, our developers to come to the door and show us a range of sites. We need that ability to draw up a viability and say, this is what is best to do. Mm. We don't need those developers thinking, actually, we'll take them into the architect and I'll, she might just buy it herself. Um, so 
don't become a developer. The prime reason we started doing the joint venturing and, and that fee sacrifice really was to break as quickly as possible into larger multi-unit developments. Yeah. It was very hard. There's so many architects in London and the size of scheme that we were doing two and a half years into practice, you know, these were schemes with 50 million pound construction values. We simply wouldn't have got there. Yeah, it's incredible. In less than 10 years with a slower churn. We had to, to really sort of dangle that uh, carrot as such to say, we're going to save you half a million pounds up front if you come with us. That's very difficult for an architect to do in terms of cash flow and yeah. had its own issues. But it means that you are, rather than being competitive with your developer, i becoming a developer, what you're doing is you're aligning your interests. Yeah. Developers feel very happy with that. You it's a collaboration. It's like it's a, a true, collaboration. true joint venture. In and it aspect. places you as lead consultant, as an architect, also into the camp of client. And that's a very powerful relationship you have actually from a point of view of force, uh, fast forward work, so ongoing work, you establish those relationships and those joint venture partnerships as an architect with a developer, he will bring you every site he sees, you know, because he knows that you're going to give him a true appraisal, appraisal based on actual the true viability and commerciality of a site. Mm. Um, architects design, site, you know, work with a site and come up with, with a scheme based on what they think is going to look best in terms of the built environment and what they think is going to be the most appropriate, what their sort of current fashion or whim is, whether they like a certain material or not, what they've been reading, what they're influenced by. All of those things are really good. Um, that's what makes us architects. I think if you want to be a fantastic architect, you actually now need to understand that we are service providers and we work as part of a bigger development machine. Yeah. If you understand that, then actually understand the commerciality of a deal really early on and understanding what makes a scheme viable or not saves a lot of time down the road. Um, and time is money on any deal. You know, delays, value engineering, changing the design, changing it multiple times before planning, that add, adds months. And to a developer, that costs thousands. Interest at that stage is in the region of 14 or 15% in terms of mezzanine lending. And so, how, and so how do you analyze whether there is viability in a particular project when it, when it first comes to you? And, and also when, you, when you're first um, sort of sacrificing those front end fees, how did, how did you make the business work? So when we have our own viability spreadsheets internally that I've developed, um, so we will take the cost of the site um, ultimately, and then we have all of our other costs, so from architects' fees to legals to engineers to, to those kind of various other fees. We'll then make an assumption of what their lending ratio is, whether that's 70% gearing or debt to 30% equity, um, and then we'll put in a cycle length and we'll basically work on what the standardized interest rates are. So at the end of that output, it gives us an IRR, which is a return on investment. Mm. So we're looking at 20%, 23 24 25%. Some of those viabilities come down quite low, and then we wouldn't invest in the scheme. And certainly now we're more picky and choosy because we have got that body of bigger work so we can continue to grow now without always joint venturing. Um, but yes, we would run our own appraisals that are separate from the developer's appraisals um, in order to come up with which deals we think are the most viable and then be able to apply that to architecture. So we need to get our net to gross to this in order to make enough saleable square footage in order to keep those IRRs over 20%. Yeah. So there's no point having two bedroom flats that are 150 square meters in size because they won't sell for more than a capped value or we need to fulfill the site to this level or we need to go up by two or three more stories. So when we're designing, we're understanding that actually if we don't achieve the square footage, no matter how the net square footage, no matter how beautiful the building is, ultimately it's unviable when plugged into that spreadsheet. You then stop wasting time on iterations. Got it. If you understand it's not, it, it speeds it up, you become more efficient because you can present hours and sheets and sheets of paper architecture to a developer, but if it doesn't stack and the viability, tear it up and start again. Uh, and I think that that probably differentiates us hugely from other architects because we don't optioneer on options that are just simply not viable in the, in the long run. Gosh, I bet um, that's like a, a breath of fresh air for many developers. Um, certainly, it's why we have a very strong client base and growing. And mm. Certainly, why developers who talk to other developers and certainly the funding backers, the, fund, the, the backers of the funds behind the developers are actually a more powerful 
sort of set of contacts for us. Developers are notoriously sharky. You know, they're sort of, they're not very friendly to one another. Whereas the funds are, are all absolutely kind of inclusion because there's so many different types of funding structure, whether mm. it's institutional, private, um, sovereign. So the, the funds are much more open in the information they share and work in a much closer way with an architect. Um, the developers potentially less so. But developers and funds talk to each other. And they'll say, look, here's an architect who really understands it. They're going to speed up the process by by designing something that's deliverable um, and that's going to work from the outset and work within the viability of the project. Uh, that speed is a is is quite a big incentive for them yeah. because it adds value at the front end when, as I said earlier, the, the cost of equity is at its highest. Yeah. Um, your second part of your question, how do you fund that um, with difficulty. So the first time we did it, I had done that year of work and done it up my bedroom. I never took very much money out of the business. I mean, I think I took a 20 grand salary. Um, I stockpiled as much money as I could in the business. Um, we took on lots of private residential, more than we could do. And um, I, I was pretty much, I think, overseeing about 40 projects at the time alongside Chris, um, who's the other, other um, director of the practice. And we were just working 100 and something hours in order to have a business that was almost funding the second half. Um, further to that, I took an extra loan of about 180000 on my mm. house and I put that into the business. Um, and that kept our working capital just about going um, throughout the project. Yeah. It's only been now really sort of three or four years later that I've actually been able to extract some of that capital. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I basically had to find a way to keep the business going with working capital. And we did that by having only two schemes were joint venturing in and then I think something like 40 single family houses um, around London which were paying the bills at the standard 12%. Amazing, brilliant. And so now the projects that, you, that you've been working on with the, de the developers, you have equity in those projects themselves? And we do. So um, I think you know, there's probably 12 projects in the practice that are more than 40 units in size. Um, of those 30%, we have equity in them. Some of them we can't. Um, the earlier on you said sort of our specialism is high end residential. Our probably biggest special, specialism now is the build to rent market. So right, most okay. of our multi unit developments are build to rent PRS um, alongside. What's PRS? Private rent sector. Yeah. So um, developments that are not built for the for sale market but built for the rental market. The structure of those deals is very different to the for sale market. Ultimately, those developers are not developing to sell to the end in market, most of those developers, unless they want to operate that, you know, those rental flats themselves, mm. are going to be selling to a pension fund, like an LNG or an MNG at the end, who will get a 4% yield on that. So those developments are repackaged at the end. And therefore, the more diluted the SPV gets, and that's that investment vehicle. Special purchase vehicle. Um, the more difficult it is to sell it on at the end. So on those ones, we may take a risk reward fee. So we may take 50% reduced fee, but then take a reward on planning. Right. Our money is really made with planning. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the model's changing slightly, but when we have for sale schemes, we certainly still invest in them. Um, the other major thing we're working on now is co working and prop tech. So, prop tech has become a very big specialism for the practice. Mm. Um, but I'd say that the majority of our projects now are built to rent PRS schemes, um, whether that be, and that's intergenerational, so whether it be retirement, student, down to private rent sector, down to actually social housing. Um, that's probably the cross-section of residential. Uh, and those deals have a different kind of structure in the way you invest. Brilliant. And so how do you kind of embed this kind of culture of business within the whole practice itself? Is this, are these kind of business deals and the structures, is, is the rest of the practice quite fluent the way that you are and the directors are? In Chris, Chris and I are very fluent in it. Um, it. Real estate investment is something that comes naturally to me. I've developed yeah. my own houses over the years and I enjoy it. I think it's a, an important part of being an architect. Chris is certainly more design fo focused mm -hmm. and design orientated, um, but equally he's fantastically commercial. Um, developers understand that together with good design, Chris actually understands that that sort of dual relationship between you know value and spend. Um, so Chris is certainly more conversive in it. I think the others are learning. We're, we're trying to do CPDs. Um, recently, we set up a, a, a second company called Joe Cowan Capital. Right. It's very much a feeder company to the business, and that's an equity platform which invests in real estate. So we actually invest in developers. 
Uh, and I think actually as the staff have begun to understand and promote Joe Khan Capital as well, certainly the lead associates and associate directors, they've started to learn and understand the structure of how development happens um, in London. So they're getting there. Um, it's certainly a different kind of education. And some mm. people have an aptitude for it and want to, and others don't. Um, but I do honestly believe, and I say this to people regularly, the days of an architect simply having a client walk in, give them a brief, you know, doing some lovely drawings, coming up with the design and giving it back to him and saying, pay for this. I think those days are over. Yep. Certainly for what I would sort of class us as, is that tier three architect coming through. Tier one being your big star architects, tier two being, you know, that emerging sort of group of architects practice to 10 years older, so your Duggan Morrises and your Caruso St. John's and that kind of thing. Um, I'd say with that tier three architect coming through um, who are growing in scale and size, but just haven't had longevity to be able to develop a big enough portfolio. Yeah. And I think for that tier, we are going to be the most compressed through the next recession, um, which is probably going to be sort of Brexit-led Soon. and then Corbyn-led. So I think that that tier of architects needs to get very creative. Mm. They don't have the body of work to rely on. As the top end of the market starts to crunch downwards, your tier twos will weaken in their fees and they'll, they'll become more adaptable. Um, your star architects will always remain slightly separate, um, but they'll take a lot of work that the tier three architects were taking and you'll see a real problem. So that tier three architect, which are those 20 to 40 person practices or say five to eight, five to 10 years old, they need to get really creative yeah, now. Because they're vulnerable, they're essentially. They're very vulnerable. Yeah. And they need to get creative um, as to whether they're going to either diversify in the services they're offering. So we're going to start Joe Khan planning this year as a planning consultancy alongside. Um, or they need to think about creatively how do they engage with their clients and how do they create those work streams. Um, or how do we create a bread and, bread and butter? We still, to this day, run 40 single houses um, run by one of the associate directors. I, I luckily don't have to have as much time to do with the, the standalone houses, but um, but we still run that as a fantastic bread and butter. Mm. Um, it's our recession proof, and it's, it's a, an unbelievable training ground for young architects who are coming out of the big practices to go through, run a couple of residential projects. You know, some of them will have construction values of four to eight million. Yeah. Um, but they'll be single houses, go through a traditional contract, waterproofing, basements. It's amazing training before coming back up onto the bigger stuff and they understand that con- they can contextualize the whole process yeah. a bit better. So how does the, can you explain a little bit more about the, the Joe Cohen, Joe Cowan uh, capital? How that works, and how do you do you bring investors into that as well? And how do you find investors? And is there ever a crossover? Say some of your clients who are doing private residential work, do they become involved? Investors. Well, investors actually, or? funnily enough, that's almost how it started. So, Joe Khan Capital started as a equity introductory platform, almost a very informal brokerage, like a dating agency. Some of the funds that we knew well, um, I do a lot of networking. I, I go to a lot of those events. They were saying to me, Joe, let us know if you've got any good developments. We need to spend this money. Developers would come in, some good developers with bad sites, some bad developers with good sites. And they'd say to me, look, we've got these sites, but we've got a funding shortage at the moment. And we'd say, okay, what if we do a pair up of these two individuals, you know, the fund and the developer? Those, that introductory service went really well. Mm. Um, and mo- both the investors and the developers did well, and they've become long, long-standing relationships. That sort of dating agency type of service earned us quite a lot of fees as well. And interestingly, once you've got the developer and the funder, you obviously automatically become the architect. It's very rare that they would, actually I don't think it's ever happened, where they wouldn't then use the architectural practice as well um, because the funds trust what I say. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we have to shoot a deal down by saying we're just simply not going to get planning for what the developer wants to. You know, we instinctively have to say very honestly to the fund, this it's not won't work. get planning yeah. um, because you need to preserve that reputation. Um, so that was the start of the capital business. From that, some of the deals that we invested in, those deals did really well. Um, they outperformed what the original expectation was. And so we would find high net worth individuals, often who were working from the domestic side, would start to approach us and say, Joe, let me know the next time you're investing in something or you're joint venturing on it, I'll follow your lead. Um, they call it their vanilla fund as such. They've got a bit of liquidity. And so we developed a, a kind of a, a, t- a club as such, so a round table whereby high net worth could sit at that table, 
They would each need to put in between three and five million, um, only 10 seats at any one time. And ultimately, we will look for assets that need investing in. So developers who come through our door that we trust mm. um, and vice versa. So we would be originating deals. Um, and that, that club would have ultimately invest in. So that's the evolution of the capital company. If that's to evolve further, which I hope it does, um, into a fund, we're going to be doing it more in combination with um, another partner and it will regulate and become something different. But ultimately what we're doing, whether it's just an introductory platform or whether it's originating sites, is we are saying, we are ultimately ensuring that the architectural practice is entirely utilized on everything so the architecture practice is what originates the deals we then fund it well it's very difficult for them to go anywhere else at that point they're not going to really go and get three other architects quotes or they certainly won't for anything more than some comps yeah um they're going to want my instinct they're going to know that we brought the deal to them so of course they're going to use us so the capital company number one it improves the relationships with developers because a they're getting capital it's a bit cheaper than they can get through a standard brokerage B, the architecture practice is what's brought that deal in yep. and we're making the promises or you know, the, non, the non-promises of what we can get planning for. Um, and then ultimately, the architecture practice does the work, but you're not competing with your client. You're, you're actually servicing your client. Um, and I think that's got to be the critical thing for all architects to think about how do we better service our clients, mm. our developers or our single homeowners or whoever they are what other service offerings can we have? Not every architect, I'm not sitting here saying that every architecture practice should go out and start sourcing funding. It's taken five years to do that yeah. and it's a slow burner. But have a think about what else you can offer. You know, look at the rest of that consultancy team. You might have an unbelievable structural knowledge and think as an architect, actually we could run a structures company on the side of the architecture practice. Um, I understand structure and I can employ a structural engineer. Um, and I can offer that service at 70% of the cost of the structural engineer because mm. it's like the same building, same resource. You don't have that time overlap for team meetings. Like we're going to set up planning consultancy. You know, we do a lot in planning and in stakeholder management. So it's a natural step for us to set up a, another offering. Yeah. Um, so as architects, they should be thinking it might be that you've got a fantastic visualization team. You might have an amazing products team. You might... Um, have a keen interest in that you might understand interiors diversify you know I think architects need to be thinking how can we offer more than one service because that's what's going to keep them afloat Um, during the tough times is that actually other parts of the business will strengthen up or you hope they are Mm. Um, particularly if you're running an office and you've got three extra desks um, that, that's really where you're going to go. Some are going into urban space planning, some are going into publications. I mean, Ryan, you've diversified into media and public yeah. relations, you know, but ultimately it's thinking what other services can I provide and how can I make that uh, cheaper? Because ultimately if it's one company providing two offerings, the second offering is going to be 70% of what your competitor is because it doesn't have all the same cost base. Yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely really, really fascinating to, to hear that and quite enlightened to hear from, from an architect. It's, we often, I mean, architects I speak to, um, so often it's easy to get trapped in just, you know, we are working, you know, we're being paid on an hourly rate. And as a business model, that is kind of it's so ultimately vulnerable. Um, totally. And, 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 and also, like, even in our, you know, how we approach projects, you know, there is, there is sometimes a resistance even uh, for architects to... Uh, realize that we're actually providing a service and how can we constantly make that service better so actually looking at the pain points of developers and these clients and how best to facilitate that and actually utilizing existing networks um, and bringing together you know as a a capital joint venture fund is i think a prime example for architects in terms of fees architects charge a fee uh I, i don't i fundamentally disagree with time charge because the value add that i add in an hour is much more than 300 pounds an hour but I think that, think about percentage fees on a project. Mm. Um, you come in with a fee of, say, 5%. Uh, and we would typically charge 30% of that to planning. There's pain at planning. So rather than bringing your fee from 5 to 4 to 3.5, why not keep your fee at 5% but only charge 15% of that fee to planning and then sign in some lock-in terms that if the project ceases post-planning, you get an additional payment. Because yeah. the reality is once that site has planning, that developer can go and borrow the cash at 
a third of the price, yeah, actually, if not more. You've unlocked a huge amount of value. Correct. You've unlocked the value. And it's just about the way you contractually set up your clause. Therefore, you're not going from 5% to 3% for the entire duration of a project. You're staying at 5%, but you're just reapportioning when you charge the fee mm. to alleviate that front-end cash. And it makes you more desirable as an architect. It's a way for all architects to keep fees at the level they should be rather than this continuous basis of undercutting. Yeah. Um, the second way you can do fees is on a resource base um, and a time charge. But I would, I put a lot on top of that because I think that what architects, what one architect does, it's, that's very simple with part twos, part ones, sort of junior. But I think if you start to think about director level, um, people have got a lot of experience. Chris can design a building in a week that would yeah. take somebody else six weeks to do. Yeah. And therefore the value of his time is not £175 an hour. Um, therefore we don't make it that. So I think value what you do as architects and value that ultimate offering. Um, but the more you offer, the more you know about, the more valuable you are. Mm. Totally. Brilliant. Um, and so you were talking earlier about this kind of the, the fast forward work that Chris does. Can you tell a bit more about that? There's these two streams of uh, of work that you have coming into the business? Well, in any business, um, people forget that there's actually two ways of generating business. Well, there's many more, but there's, there's two types of business in Jokan Architects. The first is new business. That's what everybody can identify with. Going to MIPIM, going to a drinks party, meeting somebody, cold calling them, selling your services. There are new clients through the door negotiating that first deal. That's new business. Um, and you need to be bullish and it's a certain skill set, salesy. The second type of business, which is so fundamentally important, is fast forward business, fast forward work. And that's ultimately, once that developer's come through the door, or that client, yes. is keeping him so happy while he's there that you do your second, third, fourth, and fifth project with him. That's the most efficient business. That's the business that makes the most money. Because ultimately, you don't spend that time negotiating back and forward. You're not preempting how much information is he going to require. You're not trying to preempt how many changes is he going to make. You get the general just of working together. Will Herman from West 11 Limited was the first client we joint ventured with. We're now on our eighth project. He's one of my closest friends. We've set up a company on our own together mm. actually on the side. But he is um, he's a very sort of, is a fantastic part of the business. It's the service that Chris delivered and the team delivered on his project in doing a fantastic job you know, making him money, making that viability work, that means that Will will come back. And Will's not the only one. The vast majority of our biggest projects at the moment, they're the third piece of work we've done for that developer. Yeah. As those developers grow, so their projects grow, you don't need to reprove yourself every time. They trust you. So doing an amazing job once that developer's through the door is super important. That's your fast forward work. Mm. And that's the most cost effective profit building piece that you can do. And I think architects don't necessarily always focus on it enough. Um, we pick up a lot of work halfway through projects where an architecture practice has been sacked ultimately um, and moved on. And it's because they've put, potentially taken on too much new business and not concentrated enough on their current business. If you've got a one-off house for a family, okay, and if you, know, you, you run into pro problems on the project, like I think most architects do with most single house owners, we, we, don't, we don't seem to have ever fully fallen out with a client, but it's come close. Um, the reality is that person's not going to buy a new house and keep doing houses. Exactly, okay? it's a one-off. That's a one-off, yeah. and therefore that sales and new business, super important for those practices doing single houses. The moment you are doing multi-service and developer work, fast-forward business I think is even more important. Um, and I think architects forget about that. You can't do a bad job, mm. no matter how low your fee was. And you can never sit there thinking to yourself, well, the fee's really bad on this. The developer doesn't know the fee's really bad on it. He just thinks that's the fee he agreed. Yeah. Um, so protecting that fast forward business and those clients, existing clients, is very important. Yeah. And that's really interesting as well, because so many architectural practices will get caught in that spinning their wheels of constantly, A, not even having systems to going out and finding new clients. And kind of, you know, particularly when uh, companies start up, they'll be heavily referral based. Architects, perhaps not always the best at selling. Um, and if it's a referral based business, it's unlikely you're going to get repeat business from a residential client. Yeah. And so focusing on uh, nurturing those existing relationships that can kind of build and have, you know, more deals after deals after deals makes so much sense. Yeah, 
Um, it's the way that we've grown our business, certainly. We haven't grown from naught to 40 with 40 new clients. We've mm. grown from naught to 40 with five or six. Um, and their deals have got bigger and they've enjoyed working with us and it's been a great partnership, productive partnerships. Mm. Um, you know, we have a great social relationship with our clients. We have a great intellectual relationship with our clients and we have a great financial relationship with our clients. They know we're not going to be the cheapest. We certainly aren't. Um, possibly more expensive than some of our competitors. But they understand they get that holistic offering. Um, yeah. And they know that we put everything we can into a project um, and we don't under-resource. You know, architects, we, we employ senior people. Um, we don't just try and fill a practice of part twos. You, you've got to have that experience and across the technical and the planning side. Yeah. Um, I would I would be the first to admit that I'm a hopeless technical architect. Um, it's never particularly interested me. But, you know, we have Kevin Gray, who's one of our technical directors. Um, we've got Chris Wilkinson, we've got, you know, John Humphreys and Giles. You know, their technical level is utterly incredible. You know, are they as commercial as I am? No, but it's that balance of multiple mm. multiple facets that makes yeah. us quite successful as a leadership team. Yeah, and that was the next question I was going to actually ask was what makes a successful partnership? What makes a successful leadership team? I think, look, that's different for every business. For me, Chris and I have a fantastic relationship as co-directors here in the practice. He very much understands that you know, when the sites come in, you know, we'll have conversations about it, we'll do some design together, but ultimately, most of the schemes really will be originated by Chris from that, you know, ground up first massing and viability. Mm. And Chris has his team around him, like Gareth and co, who, who help with that. Um, my skill set is really about bringing those projects in um, so that we can have, a, you know, have a good stab at them. Uh, and sometimes we work on a spec basis and sometimes we work on a paid basis on day one. The I'm very much more commercial. I run the practice. I run yeah. the business. Um, I'm always looking at that, you know, bottom line. You know, how profitable are we? At what point, you know, we you change as you grow from naught to forty. Actually, funnily enough, at fifteen we were more profitable than we were at twenty five. But that sort of, you know, improved again as we've optimized. And, and all businesses go through that. Mm. So I think having a very commercial led person and a very design led person is essential um, at the top of a practice. Yeah. Very few architecture practices are purely just a single person. Um, you know, yes, my name is above the door because I initially found the practice, but Chris is ultimately a, a complete co-director and we yeah. run it together. Underneath Chris, we then have two amazing associate directors and they are taking a lot of the actual day-to-day -day running of the practice as well as running some of the bigger projects. So Giles and, and John Humphreys, they're the associate directors. They run the resourcing. They are f they are feeding back to me on a weekly basis, you know, what's happening on the ground, you know, who's working on what the resource level is, how are staff performing, how they're not, where potentially there are unhappy clients or happy clients, you know, how do us as the directors mm. get involved. Um, so they're giving me the overall amount of information that I can then just make quite key decisions from. And then under that, we have a very key level of, of associates and senior associates with project architects. The pyramid is, is very important, but I think that you're, you've got to have a leadership team that A, teaches. Um, it's very important that, that we avoid egos um, at the top. Um, we don't have private offices in this building. We all sit together. Um, it's non-ego based. Yeah. I don't like anybody to have a sort of feeling that this is my design. Nothing is my design. Um, so that collaborative approach. But the leadership team need to be a mixture of people who understand the commercials of running a business um, and a mixture of people who teach, um, who are bringing up younger staff and nurturing um, and actually then also some of those, there's a couple of individuals here are very soft. They're, they're sort of understanding what, you know, how a part two or a part three is feeling at that point when they've been pulled off one project and put on another and they're feeding that back. So we don't forget that everyone in this practice is looking at their own career progression. Um, we don't sort of have a, a sort of lower level who aren't being embraced, but I think that's really important. So well, that's very important to me. Um, no ego. Um, yeah. Everybody being approachable. Um, everybody in the senior leadership team needs to understand that ultimately as a practice we have to make money um, and therefore, you know, sort of indulging excessive time on sort of some ideas which will never come to fruition, you know, needs to be pushed back. But at the same time, we've got two of the other associates uh, there just to promote new designs and keep that think tank philosophy mm. going. 
Um, the key to any practice is to keep staff. Do not lose your staff. We have virtually no turnover of staff other than those either going back to university or back um, to Spain, it seems. Um, but keep your staff and keep them happy. Do those. You know, we invest heavily in a weekend away for the office skiing every year and those team building activities and lectures. I think we're going to Cornwall this summer, mm. surfing for four days. As a practice, we spend money on staff. Yeah. You know, and that's really important. Yeah, that's always, a, again, a, a massive pain point for most architectural practices is losing and rehiring, losing yeah. and rehiring. And the newer generation, and I say that, um, you know, like I'm ancient, but the millennials as such, of which I'm not, um, uh, there's a much bigger predisposition to moving around. You know, yeah. when I when I got into Rogers, I stuck, you know, you didn't move. Um, you know, when I had, you know, if you had a good job, you, you stuck with it. Whereas now people are more fluid, they move around. That's not all bad because you get an unbelievable kind of mixture of, of skills, but uh, it's not perfect um, mm. either. So you need to understand how do you keep challenging your junior members and feeling like they're making that career progression. And actually it's that balance between having them on a single house alongside being on a 80 unit built rent scheme, um, ha enforcing that they all go to site literally every week is another thing is forcing people onto site. And, and do you find a lot of younger, younger staff, younger architects are kind of more commercially and entrepreneurially minded? Um, no, I think there's a fundamental problem in what the UK universities are teaching. Mm. A, I think seven years is too long. Um, I think the part three is the most useful year, bar the design. But uh, I think that the number of students who come in here, um, particularly from some of the schools like the Bartlett, you know, um, the RCA as well, they don't know the difference in brick and block work. I mean, we are training people technically from day one. That's fine for people who have an aptitude for it, but mm. I do find that quite startling. And secondly, I just think that architecture education now should have a property real estate element to it. There should be an element of the course which teaches you how fund structures and how property development works because it's not just a UK model, it's worldwide. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think that would be great if people learnt it. It's not necessary so much when you've got one person running a practice who sort of has that understanding but it just means that decisions are made right at the sort of base level about, you know, the type of doors and the layout of a kitchen. And, it's always you know, being fed back into that wider understanding. understanding. Yeah, and that's... And the context, it's financial not, context. Correct, and it's not to say that you don't make a decision in the, in the favour of design because it doesn't work for the net to growth. It's you know, the net to growth ratio. So it's not that we only make decisions based on profit. It's just that you calculate and you're more clever in saying, is it worth that loss? You know, is actually what we're going to achieve by doing this layout worth that loss in, in, in net to gross ratio? Mm. Um, yes, it might be. You know, you might say this is going to be a fantastic flat. If it's a terrible flat, it won't sell anyway. So you can't design bad apartments or, or you know, bad commercial spaces. But it's just understanding whether it's worth it. Yeah. Understanding where that elasticity and end value is versus actually those decisions you make through the design process. Yeah. So what's next? What's next for Joe Cohen? Well, Cohen? I think um, I think uh, I think Joe Cohen Architects is going to go from strength to strength, um, and it's obviously the prime business. We want to grow, um, but growth for us is not necessarily about bums on seats. Um, I think that's another fundamental mistake architects make. Growth is much more about um, marginal growth, but you know the types of projects we take mm. on. Um, we want to now invest much more in, in choosing the projects we want to do. Um, Joe Khan Capital will continue to grow alongside Joe Khan Architects, but it's very much a secondary, a secondary company. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have Joe Khan planning up and running um, as a planning consultancy company, um, which will work with some of that stakeholder management and that sort of comms and you know communication with local planning, you know, offices. So that that's the plan for this year. Um, but you know, nothing ever goes according to plan. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's absolutely really, really enlightening um, to hear all this kind of entrepreneurial thinking and how it's kind of so deeply embedded into your practice. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Ryan. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. 
The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.